Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, before I introduce my guest this week, just a note about an upcoming Locals event, which is happening this week. It's on Tuesday, 6th of February, Tuesday, 6th of February, in the evening in Wellingborough. So if you are in Wellingborough or round about there and want to join us, please do. It should be a very good evening. Our Locals events are happening all over the country now, I'm pleased to say. It's a great success. Um, our speaker uh, on that evening is going to be Ben Habib, who is deputy leader of the Reform Party. He's standing in the Wellingborough by-election. So it should be a very, very uh, good evening. He's a great speaker, Ben. Uh, so if you want to come, uh, we can send you the details, the venue and time. Uh, please do write to locals at newcultureforum.org.uk and uh, we will send you all the details. Now, my guest this week was one of the very first, actually, to come on this channel five years ago, uh, Professor Eric Kaufman, Professor of Politics, um, also the author of a great book called White Shift, amongst many others. Um, welcome, Eric. It's great to see you. Um, great one, to be back. <laughs> one, of the, one of the reasons I wanted to speak to you is because um, this is quite, I feel, quite momentous, but you have created a course the only one so far at a Western university uh, which is looking at the subject of woke. Am I correct? You are correct. You are correct. And the course is, is launching imminently. Right. Uh, it's an online course open to anybody in, in the world. We, and you can actually just subscribe to the lectures for only 80 pounds. So it's something we're trying to make accessible to a lot of people. Right. Um, and yeah, so what this course does is it, it's just all I'm doing is I'm saying this is an ideology like any other. It's not the way it's presented in institutions, which is like you, you must do this to be a good person. No, that is an ideology similar to any other ideology. So we're going to study it the way we'd study an ideology like fascism or communism or liberalism empirically, dispassionately, but we're going to put it on the table and dissect it. And, and that's all that, that, that I'm doing. So what, how, what, how is the course, how, how will the course be made up? Are there modules and things like that? So, it's a long time so to yeah, yeah, that. it's well, no, it's fifteen weeks. Each week is um, uh, an, a lecture of maybe an hour to an hour and a half, plus some readings that are relevant to that week. Uh, it's in probably around four parts. So you know, we part one is really the intellectual history and origins of woke ideology. So where does it come from? And you know, there are different DNA goes back to. Uh, humanitarianism, liberalism, and egalitarianism, but those things then combine in different ways to become the cultural left by the 1960s, and then turning the dial further becomes something like you know more extreme, so cancel culture and uh, knocking down statues and all the erasing history and all that is part of the extremism that takes hold of this movement. So the first part's really about intellectual history and origins. Then we look at public opinion, you know male, female, young, old, left, right, who, are, who supports this ideology, how does it work in institutions, and then moving into how it shapes elections, the culture wars, how are they moving uh, voters in many different countries, and then finally we're going to look at the political philosophy behind it. You know, what are the arguments that people who are essentially woke make in favor of shutting down speech, for example? Yeah. Um, and then what are, the, what are the arguments against? So we're going to look also at the political philosophy. So would you say that the political philosophy, I think it, from what you say there you would, uh, is in fact just a further development of hard left ideology? Or is it more than that? Well, I think, and this is actually, I'm, I've got a book out in May called Taboo, where one of my arguments is, is that actually this is more about liberalism in a way. It is about Marxism, you know, switching from class to identity as the category of, of the oppressed. That, you know, that's definitely going on. But what I, the, the point that I try to make is that actually liberalism in its modern form, not classical liberalism, which values freedom of the individual, but modern liberalism, which is really about a mix of the left with liberalism. Yes. That's where we get the race taboo coming in in the mid 60s, the idea that this is a sacred category and racial minorities are sacred groups that you can't offend and almost you worship as spiritually and emotionally more you know, deeper and higher 
that kind of outlook um, stems from that race taboo, which is not something that was driven by the Marxist left. It was driven by liberals. Yeah. And so, and, and actually, even the idea that you want to be, that minorities are good and majorities are bad, that's not necessarily a Marxist type of way of thinking, but it's a liberal way of thinking yeah. that has become, the dial's been turned up. So a lot of what, what's, what we're living through is actually liberalism gone amok. So for example, being sensitive to minority groups, uh, being understanding, that minority sensitivity dial's been twisted all the way. So now anything, if you can't pronounce somebody's surname, that's racism. Or if you are, if skiing is, all, you know, got, got very few minorities in it, that's racism. So it's just an extreme spread of this idea of the taboo to more and more and more spheres of life. And that happens kind of in a ratchet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we move from um, Negro to black to African American, back to black again, all of these kinds of creeping. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and similarly with Supreme Court decisions, uh, hostile environment, if you have a sea of pinups, then it's hostile environment if you're critical of Iran's supreme leader, because that could be taken as Islamophobic. Mm. You, you see how all of this yes. is creeping, and the judicial decisions and the administrative decisions are always in one direction. And so it's not like they said, we want to have a revolution. It's more that they're constantly pushing the sensitivity envelope, and eventually it just gets crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, uh, I, I, that's a much more nuanced take on it, because yeah. the, mine would be that this is an attack, an outright attack, you know, um, right. on on the very basis of our civilization. Um, and I suppose one has seen it as a form of Marxism, but I suppose the kind of Marxists I know, yeah. or former Marxists, don't have much truck with woke, actually, I suppose. Right. I'm, I'm thinking of your Claire Foxes and your right. the people <laughs> who are all in that group, if they yes. are still Marxists. You're yeah. Basically, you're saying it's actually just a complete mutation of liberalism. Well, I think there's a convergence. So there's no question, like Chris Rufo's book, uh, America's Cultural Revolution, he traces the very real linkages between the Black Panthers and, and black radicalism and BLM, for example, or you know, through people like Angela Davis or Antifa related to the weather underground. And so there's no question there is a you know, hey, we couldn't do revolution on class, we're going to do revolution on, on race. Yeah. You know, that exists. But my argument is that would have gotten nowhere. You know, why were universities hiring these people as professors in the 70s? You know, that wouldn't have happened unless there was a sympathy yes. from the liberals who might not want to overthrow society, but they are constantly trying to be, you know, they feel guilty and they want to be nice. And yeah. so that bleeding heart element works very well with the radical element. And right. so I guess I think the bleeding heart element is more important in explaining why this has been so successful in its takeover. This, uh, yeah. it, yes, because there is also a religious aspect to it, isn't it? Kind of, I am yeah. a good person yeah. and the, the, my opponent is actually therefore kind of wicked. Right, and, and, and that stems from this very simple minorities positive, majorities negative. Yeah outlook which is held not just by the m cultural Marxists but also by these modern left liberals right. and there that's why there's a, a harmony between the two mm -hmm. so I think Rufo gets the cultural Marxist picture right but mm -hmm. he's he's missing the story of why did a majority 51 percent of Seattle voters endorse defund the police that's not those are not all people who want to overthrow the system the, a lot of them are just these bleeding heart types yeah. uh, and so we have to look at those bleeding heart liberal types. Um, I think they're the key to it. And um, I think actually that's, that's quite interesting. I remember, you know, as far ago as the 80s, you know, mm. that Marxists had a particular contempt for liberals. Right. <laughs> and they actually preferred discussing with conservatives because they knew where they stood, where the liberal will always sort of have this kind of slight guilt on their back. And they would, they would never go against the hard left because they, some, somewhere in their subconscious, they sort of felt that that's where they should really be. You know? <laughs> right, but they right. couldn't go that far. With the, with the court, it's at the University of Buckingham, yes. isn't it? So yeah. the University of Buckingham is like Brit still Britain's only private university, isn't it? Or? It's one of the very few. Um, but what's interesting is it was founded as Britain's only private university, but now I think its new role as it sees itself increasingly is to be the only free speech university. Yeah out of 181 institutions in Britain, the only non, avowedly non-progressive. Now, it's still the case that most of the 
staff and students probably are leaning left, but um, it's a more open climate. And in the uh, you know the National Student Survey, they were in the top, they were scored top in free speech. So I think that's kind of it's trying to chart a different direction. Yeah. And there's nothing like that in in Britain. The other thing I should say is that I'm you know in addition to this course, I'm setting up a center, which is launching. Um, late in February, uh, where this is really a, re a research center that will focus on asking the questions that are no longer being asked or pursuing the uh, theories that are no longer acceptable to, to, right. to pursue. So for example, um, if we're going to explain race or gender inequality, now it could be due to discrimination, but a proper uh, social science would say, well, we'll test the discrimination theory, but we'll also test other theories such as you know, what does the culture uh, of these groups, you know, what does it value? Does it value saving, book learning, et cetera, or yeah. not? Uh, you know, what is the average uh, earnings uh, of this group? Are they poor or are they rich? So, you, so you're actually going to look at other factors besides discrimination to explain gaps uh, and test them out and see which one works. That, that would be a normal way to proceed. But of course, those alternative arguments are taboo you won't get published uh, if you uh, even if you don't get canceled you're not going to get published so the the the, the truth seeking mission of the entire university is warped away from pursuit of truth to pursuit of truth as long as it is kosher yes. ideologically so this center the yeah. is this also going to be at buckingham yes yes so there are going to be a lot of people watching now who would love to do your course i'm sure so it's open to everybody <clears throat> Absolutely, yeah. And um, and how would they? Uh, first of all, when is it starting? And and how would they apply? Right. So if you just go to my Twitter at the pinned tweet, uh, yeah. there's a link there through to you. Just click on that, and then you can choose one of three options: uh, either just the lectures or the lectures plus seminar. Um, we are starting imminently, so yeah. don't don't delay. Uh, wait, wait, imminently being? Im well, imminently being sort of next week, you know. Oh, uh, but, in, but, but what I'd also say is there, we may actually have a, a sort of another seminar session in March. And the other thing I should say is that those who choose the lecture only option, it's rolling. It, you, there's no start date or end date because right. you just have, get access to the lectures and readings. So it doesn't really matter when you sign up, you can sign up anytime. And this is done online? It's all online, yes. It's all online. Um, and right so um well unless you choose the if you want to do a master's degree option then that's conventional in person right. that starts next year however oh i see okay yeah. um and if people <laughs> excuse me if people are not on twitter eric i know this sounds uh, i'm asking a lot <laughs> How yeah. would they find out about it? Because an awful lot of people are not on Twitter. Right. Okay. So then you, you if you just probably Google University of Buckingham uh, woke, course on woke, you'll probably I'll find it that way. Yeah. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> so. um, I think it's just wonderful what you're doing. I, I mean, um, I just wanted to ask what sort of brought you to this point of, of doing yeah. University of Buckingham. When I last spoke to you, when you were last in, um, and indeed, of course, you've spoken at our conferences too. You were right. at Birkbeck, weren't you? Probably. Yeah, so this is the reality of um, the mainstream university system in the 21st century is that there's a lot of pressures if you're critical of the orthodoxy. And so I was a critic of woke, you know, from about 2018 onwards. Mm. Um, and that got me the attention of you know, the student union radicals, radical faculty and students and even some al alumni or people who claim to be alumni of, right. of our department. You know, so they co there were complaints, internal investigations, Twitter mobs, open letters, the whole, you name it, I, I experienced it for from about 2018 on until about 2022. Wasn't enough to push me out and I had good support from the Free Speech Union, so I wasn't worried about losing my job. Um, and actually, the, the you know, places like NCF, the FSU and others now provide pretty good pushback to some of this. However, it's still not ideal. I mean, you want to have a nice work environment where, now I didn't get along badly with my colleagues, but it's almost like there was an awkwardness yes. injected by all this publicity. So they kind of didn't, they knew I was a bit radioactive, even though I'd known some of them for 20 years. Yeah. Um, so it just makes it a little more difficult. Uh, and then I knew, I was aware of Buckingham's profile emerging under 
the new uh, VC James Tooley, who's who's really a, an innovative uh, oh, yeah. force. James Tooley. Yeah. Yeah, and so I kind of, you know, I, I had uh, been talking with James, and then when you know Birkbeck, I decided to leave Birkbeck, and then um, I began speaking to, to to Buckingham, and eventually we figured that yeah, you know, and it's quite exciting because in a way it's an opportunity to build something different mm -hmm. because even though we've got the Academic Free Speech Bill, which I've been involved with. That can maybe protects you from getting fired, but what it doesn't protect you from is not getting hired, promoted, mm -hmm. published, uh, you know, having a nice work environment and not being ostracized. None of that is included with this legislation. It can't be, because those are social processes. Mm -hmm. What you actually therefore need is viewpoint diversity within an institution, which means an institution which has a mix of different views. And Buckingham, at least in places, is aiming to have that so that you'll have a place that conservative staff and students, for example, will feel comfortable or anti-woke liberals even will feel comfortable expressing views. Because yes. um, we know, I mean, in surveys that about three quarters of, you know, between half and three quarters of conservative academics in the UK self-censor in research and teaching. Oh. Uh, student, students, it's not quite as high, but it's often a majority of conservative students self-censoring. So there isn't free debate, there isn't free inquiry, and what we're trying to do is create a space where we can have a more open discussion. Do you think that the creation of these kind of spaces, new universities actually in some ways, do you mm. think that that really is the only realistic way forward? Because when people say you need diversity of thought at universities, who could possibly disagree? I just can't see it happening. I mean, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> even if we have a free speech czar or something, yes. university, or whatever we have, it's so embedded that I find myself going for this option of, you know what, just shut them down. You know, mm. or, I know that sounds crazy, but just yeah. it, they have, they're lost, you know, and the same thing is happening, obviously, we were talking about before we came on air uh, in America as well, mm. you know, what we saw, particularly during the um, uh, the it was a congressional committee, wasn't it, with the yes, heads yeah, of yes. Harvard and the various yeah. Ivy League, and what they were saying. Just you thought th these places are are actually lost as seats of learning. I mean, yes, think I think you're you're sadly, I think you're right. Um, the question is, what is the best way forward? Yes. Because certainly the private institutions like Harvard and a lot of the Ivy League. You know, they're still going to keep running. They've got huge endowments. Uh, the question is how best to, uh, do you want to sort of try and cut funding, in which case they'll just survive on student fees. I still think you'll have the top half of the system, which influences the culture, will still continue. Mm. And so I'm not sure that's the best approach. I would rather see more intrusive government regulation mm. by obviously a right of center government, which is the only government that can do it. Yeah. Something like what Ron DeSantis is doing in Florida, where there's an attempt to selectively defund, carrot and stick your way into these universities. Um, so for example, Florida universities now are increasingly required to have centers that are non-progressive, that, right. that have an avowedly you know, pro-American history constitution, Western canon, all of that stuff. They have to set up these separate centers that are government funded that are against the grain of the mainstream university. Mm -hmm. I think that's one way of inserting some intellectual diversity into the... Yeah. The other thing is cut cutbacks on DEI, yeah. uh, D defunding grievance studies programs, so incentivizing, cajoling. Uh, I think that's maybe the best strategy because I think if you cut funding, all that'll happen is the wealthier 20 universities, top ones that influence the culture, mm. will survive and they'll just go all in. Well, they're already all in on woke, but you're not gonna damage the beast. Uh, whereas I'd rather see a much more concert, concerted attempt to really regulate them and really cajole them into uh, having more intellectual diversity. You said that you, you, know, you had this kind of you know, complaints and pressure. It seems to me, uh, uh, you tell me if I'm wrong that they the, the complaints or the kind of you know sort of uh, hostility that might have been towards you was just simply because you looked at certain subjects not that even that you were actually yeah. you know <laughs> proclaiming any particular view it was just even yeah. like uh, talking about demographics in white shift 
Presumably that is just a red rag to them, is it? Well, well it's interesting because you pointed the book, but the, the, the bottom line, they don't read books. I mean, most of these people who are making a noise don't spend any time really reading. So mm. that's not really what it is. It's all based on social media posts or media appearances. Oh. Uh, mm. And it's all about criticizing, you know, criticizing quote unquote anti-racist or, you know, anti-LGBT so-called mm. movements. Mm. Um, so for example, even something like retweeting Justin Trudeau on being unable to pronounce LGBTQ, stumbling over it a bunch of times, making fun of that, you know, <laughs> that's enough to get you in trouble. Uh, you know, make you know, any, anything critical of BLM. Yes. Uh, you know, these things, and they, they accumulate in your file, and, and they make stuff up. So I, I reviewed uh, Douglas Murray, and I, I think his book Madness of Crowds is somewhere here, yeah. but I um, reviewed it in the Financial Times, and, and I used one of Douglas's phrases. He talked about slaying the dragon that's, that's no longer there and waving your sword in the air. Yeah. Uh, these activist groups have, have no real discrimination to combat yeah. anymore. Yeah. And, and I used that phrase, and they claimed that I really meant to kill um, a, a member of staff. And oh, so they were, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> that, that, that was my subliminal meaning. They, yeah. This is the kind of level that, that yes. these hearings were, were dr uh, stooping to because you know, the, the very leadership of the university actually is, was fine at Birkbeck, you know, uh, but it's the people who, in, who have small positions of power who run a hearing, for example. Yes, and that's yes. the kind of person who volunteers for that is going to be someone who really believes in DEI and, and cancel culture. So you're getting that kind of person running these kangaroo courts and, and they'll just throw anything at you, right? Yeah. And, and this is supposed to be an official investigation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's, it's quite funny. Uh, but you know. I mean, sort of quite funny. Well, not funny when you're but, in it. No, no, no I was going to say because the thing is, I suppose you wouldn't have done. But I don't mm. recall during that period of eight, uh, 2018 up to now, what, so six, yeah. six years, five, six years, um, you always, you've got a very positive and cheery demeanor. Kind of <laughs> Thanks. Thing, right? um, never heard you complain or anything about it. But it must, I mean, what was it like living under that? Though? Yeah, it's very unpleasant and, it, and it's always on your mind. You know, when you get that email, the, that first email that says, there's been a complaint against you, violation of section whatever, mm. policy and work and study, please report to here, mm. you know, blah, 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 all this official stuff, and, and we'll decide what your fate is. You know, so they always leave it hanging, and they know that, you know, a person's mind goes immediately to, oh, will I be fired? Yeah. And, and of course, in academia, once you're out, out, you can't get back in, basically. And you certainly can't get back in anywhere near where you want to live or in the place you want to teach but probably you're toxic anyway. Yeah. Um, so they have an enormous amount of power. And yeah, you, you, you start worrying and fretting. And, uh, and then of course you go through these hearings and it's all very much about, and they mm. always, well, they'll often find you guilty, but then the, the punishment will, will be unspecified so that they keep you kind of hanging. Yes. And it's, all, it's, it, it's sort of that game. They know they probably, you know, probably they can't legally fire you, but they kind of want to scare the hell out of you and get you to, to kowtow. So that's kind of the game. You know? by, by not basically, for example, maybe tweeting or not saying things on social media or not doing media of any sort. That's the kind of thing. Right? Exactly. They, they want you Keep to shut mainstream. up on, yeah. on media and um, not yeah. to um, you know, make anybody feel offended, mm -hmm. uh, especially of these groups that are you know, mm -hmm. named in these policies or on her, what is quote unquote harassment. You know, you can set off flares uh, when Kathleen Stock comes to the university. That's fine, but but boy, you better not tweet anything that might offend mm -hmm. one of these. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so this is sort of the and of course the problem is the universities have been pushed by activist staff into mm -hmm. adopting, into signing up to the race equality charter and Athena Swan and uh, we're friendly to refugees. All all these kinds of covenants and, and uh, kite marks that they sign up to in statements that, you know, we are an open inclusive university and then the activists will use that against them when they don't cancel people oh, you, you you signed up to this and here's yeah, somebody saying yeah. that and he's going against what you signed up for so you've got to discipline him yes. uh, you know so so in a way they've provided the ammunition already to the university to then cancel somebody and they, and so it's just this big ratchet where they're all working in combination to try and create uh, this environment. The only thing I will say is I do think that some of the energy 
behind the cancel culture movement seems seems to have ebbed a little bit since about 2021. Right. Not gone away by any stretch, but some of the boldness has has dec declined. You have to do more now for them to to work up a mob against you, I think. That used anything, to be the case. The you know. only thing that would worry me slightly there is, that, is it because they think they've kind of won? You know, that often yeah. when, when people think that that's it, we've won, we are in position, they can afford to be slightly magnanimous or just sl slightly more tolerant. You know, I, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm being... Um, your book coming out, you said Taboo? Yeah, it's that's called Taboo. Title. Yeah, Taboo, um, How Making Race Sacred Led to a Cultural Revolution. That's the title. Yeah. How Making Race Sacred Led to a Cultural yeah. Revolution. That's what yeah. Speaking of which, I mean, you know, this book was basically looking at demographics, particularly uh, in white majority countries, wasn't right. it? And the general drift of the book was that, well, they're going to end up not white majority right. countries. And it was quite, well, what, how, what do we do about that? Or what do we do anything about that? Um, I just was struck yesterday by these new statistics and this coming out for Britain from the Office of National Statistics saying that our population in this country is going to go up by over 6 million by, I think it is, 2036 or something. And that something like between 2021 and 2036, it would have been something like 13 million or some new people or something like that. Right. These are astonishing figures, are they not? I mean, when you wrote this about six years ago? Yes, five, 2018, ago. yeah. So are things going pretty much as you say they would? Well, yes, because I mean, the, the, the book really is, was in two, two parts. The most of the book was about the rise of populism mm. and what lay behind it. Uh, the populist moment, 2014, we see UKIP, National Front uh, in France, uh, Danish People's Party hitting about 30% of the mm. European uh, election vote. Then we had Trump, then we had Brexit, then we had, uh, or the rise of Trump to become a leader in the primaries. Then the US and British, uh, the, the Brexit vote, the US election. And then after that, Salvini and these other European uh, populists doing better and better. AFD, Sweden Democrats, etc. Then we had, okay, so that was the book, came out in 2018 before the pandemic. Pandemic hits. 2019 and that takes some of the steam out of the rise of populism mm. immigration drops because of the pandemic a few years the things kind of the technocrats you need technocrats perhaps to manage a pandemic yeah and then mm. we're out of it and now we're ex right back where we were even more so in 2014 with the populist moment so what i'm seeing now is a replay, but even more so. Mm. So we are going to see the populist right do even better than they did in 2014. Say in the European elections, uh, Le Pen may get in in France. Trump's looking on course to win, perhaps. Looks to be I the think case. Looks likely now, actually. Sorry, it? I think it looks rather likely. Yeah, he's in a stronger yeah. position, certainly in the polls, than prior to 2016 when he won. Mm. And there are a number of reasons why I think he's more likely to win. Uh, and of course, so, so we have this this dynamic now, and immigration has been very high again. Post pandemic shoots up in Australia, in Canada, in Britain, in, you know, so it's gone gone up in many places, and that's really what's behind the uh, uh, the rise of populism. I mean, that's that was the point in the book: is yeah. migration numbers drive the salience of immigration, which drives populist voting, mm -hmm. and so it is exactly the same thing as what I wrote about in. 2018 and the question is going to be how the kind of elite reacts so they sort of doubled down and said no these people are terrible and they're deplorable and uh, no we just have to stick to the formula mm. uh, we're going to ostracize them we're going to, of course that actually makes only makes people more popular um, and now the question is what they do this time around so for example your let's say in the European elections the the populist right some are arguing that the scale of their, depending on how big their vote is, they may be able to take over certain key positions and change policies. And I know there's already talk now that they will be more organized mm. in dismantling and changing certain EU policies. So what's going to be the impact on the EU of this vote? Number one, 
what is the uh, what, are, what is the American mainstream media going to do in reaction to Trump's getting into office, for example? Uh, are we going to see the same Trump derangement syndrome, the same kind of resistance? You know, that's a big question. We don't know what their response is going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, ha I remember talking to uh, an American kind of left-wing but sane left-wing journalist who sort of said, we need Trump to win again so that these people realize that the what they can't keep going the way they've been going right, with okay. with the woke agenda and and so for example Biden the woke agenda means that he can't control the border means that you know the scenes we had of them cutting open the razor wire that the Texas uh, yeah. border authorities had put up to keep the migrants out and all these migrants scream, streaming in all these images uh, you know that's going to contribute to Biden being defeated and that hopefully that will then concentrate the saner minds on the left to say we've got to get we've got to get control of these activists and put them back in their box. Yes, it is quite extraordinary yeah. some of the stuff that the Biden has come out with. I mean, when you have a president a couple of years ago now was it saying that the biggest problem our country faces is that of white supremacy. Right. <laughs> he actually said that and you sort of yeah. Whatever your view on that, to actually say that about your own country yeah, yeah. You know, as the president um, was quite quite extraordinary and I thought despicable actually. But yeah. were you surprised, for example, to see the uh, election of Gert Wilders in the Netherlands? Uh, not really. Yeah. I mean, because yes, Wilders, you know, there is a certain volatility in populist right politics where certain parties will rise and fall quite quickly. Mm. You know, when there's a new brand, so Thierry Baudet came in with a new party, that suddenly became flavor of the month, then the Farmers Party came in and collapsed. But, uh, but really what that's showing is that there was a strong reservoir of support for somebody who's going to articulate a message of defending the nation, yeah. restricting immigration. Immigration is the absolute key issue. Mm. Uh, immigration's been going up across Europe. There have been more crossings of the Mediterranean just as there have been more crossings in Britain, there have been more crossings in America. So in all of these cases, post-pandemic, there's been this surge, and the reaction to that has been discontent, which mm. populists are, are poised to tackle. The other thing, too, is the more the economy drops out of the news, the more inflation drops. Yes. The more space there is for cultural issues like migration and the culture wars to rise. So just prior to the populist wave in 2014, 15, 16, concern about the economy had been falling post the financial crisis. So actually, when people are not worried about pandemic and as worried about the economy, there's more room to return to the cultural issues that drive right. populism. Right. Uh, all those countries you go through, the one glaring omission is this one. <laughs> In that, we, we appear, and I think this might be one of the reasons why there is such a kind of level of frustration and anger. We appear to have no kind of opposition to any of this. Oh, we oppose it, and very right. huge <laughs> groups do, and you do, and there are lots of us who oppose it. But in terms of politics, there seems to be no real. To say that reform, whatever you think of them, is a kind of populist party, I think is really to misread it, actually. I mean, not right. in the way that you're, you're okay. meaning, I think. I mean, what. What, what would you say has to happen here? I mean, it's got to basically, hasn't it, be a complete change of the electoral system, but that's not going to come for quite a while. So what do people do who, who feel, you know, this level of frustration and passion that they would do voting for Trump in America or for Marine Le Pen? What mm. do they do? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I suppose reform has been benefiting to some degree. There, some of the polls have had them as high as 13 percent, which is nothing to sneeze at, you know. Oh, yeah. um, and right. and so that is one vector. But you're right that reform, in many ways, is emphasizing too many issues, and some many of which are not resonating. Uh, they should be probably focusing more squarely on migration. Absolutely, and we talk about it all the time. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, there's also, a, you know, I'm just looking at other places. So Germany elected a, a, a center-left government, and then very quickly their popularity cratered. Mm. And now the AFD and more uh, immigration restrictionist uh, left-wing, a new left-wing party mm. has emerged. 
And so one possible scenario is labor gets in, you know, migration remains high. A year in, people maybe have, had been pinning certain hopes on Starmer. A, a year in, his popularity collapses. Now, that, now that's, I think, probably the most likely scenario. The other thing I should, and, and so this discontent around uh, the cultural stuff, the migration, will eventually uh, be pinned on Starmer. Right now, yeah. all the Tories are the are the target for all discontent. And so Labour's getting off very light. Once Labour's in, it will attract more of this discontent. And so then there will be more opportunities. Now the question will be, what's going to... So if we just look at the right side of the political map, the Tories have totally discredited themselves by essentially taking an interpretation of Brexit, which was the Global Britain interpretation, mm -hmm. rather than what most voters wanted, which was sort of reduction of migration. Mm -hmm as a central motive for Brexit. Um, so the question then is, is it a rev revived reform under a Farage figure? That it, it may be that Farage comes in or somebody comes in, in in reform that is perhaps more charismatic than Tice, threatens to usurp the Conservative Party because at 13% yeah. with the Tories down yeah. around 20, it's yeah. not much further before they're level pegging. Yeah. Um, that hopefully then leads within the Tory party to the National Conservative faction yeah. taking over and eventually, eventually pushing out or at least minimizing the impact of the Tory wets who are currently in control of the party. And, and so you, there are all these kind of complicated dynamics, but I think really people need to be sort of focusing on right now probably reform or sending a signal that yes. they don't like the kind of liberal conservative direction that's dominant in the Tory party. And, and of course, when they lose, which is almost certain, there will be this post-mortem and the battle will be, oh, well, we lost because we were too restrictionist or we were too liberal. Uh, the liberals will be saying, oh, it, you, t you sound too restrictionist and you chased away those centrist voters who would have voted for us, mm -hmm. which is nonsense. And we know mm -hmm. from the uh, analysis is nonsense. And so they'll want to keep the party and ev even move it to the left. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you'll have the Nat Cons and, you know, the John Hayes and Miriam Cateses and Danny Krugers who will be wanting to move it towards really where the voters are. Um, and I guess the question is, what's going to be the outcome of that Tory civil war? I think that's very important. Oh. I think probably what happens after the election is yeah. going to be the most exciting thing as opposed to what happens before because you know if the Tory party is a British, there's a one outside chance of course that what could happen is what happened in Canada your country which is where basically the, the Conservative party was left with about two seats wasn't it right or, or something ridiculous yeah. in 1993 wasn't it and it was called reform wasn't it yes reform the party. reform party yeah. <coughs> and that was with the that was with first past the post wasn't it yes that's extraordinary, isn't it? It is, but there's a difference in the sense that the Reform Party in Canada was had a Western base, and so it could win seats in a way that the Reform Party in Britain is just across the entire country, mm. a certain percentage of people voting Reform. So it doesn't have as much of a regional concentration. It was very much a Western movement. Right. Um, and, I mean, it was also more conservative, more conservative economically in, in, than the Mm. kind of progressive conservatives as they were called. So it's not a perfect analogy, but yes, the, the, the ruling party was decimated down to two seats, so a complete wipeout. Mm. I don't see that level of wipeout happening here, uh, but I, it's certainly possible, but I don't see it quite that bad. But I think it's no. more going to be no. still this battle for the soul of the conservatives. If you think of the Republicans prior to Trump, they were all about quite high immigration, low tax, that was, and foreign policy, you know, democracy promotion in Iraq and play. That's their brand of conservatism. That was backed by the donors, the, the country club Republican class, the, the Bush brothers, etc. Uh, then you had Trump come in, the Tea Party and Trump, and they managed to take over the party mm -hmm. and overthrow the kind of more liberal conservative establishment. Mm -hmm. that, that hasn't happened here. Even though the voters here, like there, it's a more working class, more populist nationalist voter that's voting for the right. But the leadership in the U.S. has pivoted and looks more like its voters were yes, here. Yes. It's still the old as if we we're in the 1970s and 80s. Mm. And that is really the, the change that needs to happen mm. for the system to readjust to the new uh, voting base of the Conservatives. The 2019 voter is not the 1980 voter, for example. No, what a missed opportunity, though. Mm. I mean, that's the 20, you know, what happened in yeah, 2019. Yeah. 
Unbelievable. Um, well, a lot of the Tories in the Tory party, I think, should certainly go on your course. <laughs> they need to learn about it, because I'm, I'm often shocked by their kind of general ignorance of yes. what's going on. You know, it's unbelievable oh, yeah. complacency. But, Eric, thank you so much. I mean, if you would stay with us, just because I have a few yeah. questions for, for our members, our exclusive members. But um, what I'll say in, in, the, in the meantime is that um, if people are interested in your course, we will put under this video um, where people should go um, and basically to sign up or find out more. Um, all the very, very best with it. Thank you very, very much, Eric. Thank Thanks, Peter. It's been a pleasure. Um, so uh, that's it for this week, and uh, I shall see you next week. In the meantime, have a good time, will you? Good week. Bye bye. Bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you. Thank you.